Hi everyone, my name is Catherine, I'm the People and Wildlife Officer here at the Scottish Wildlife Trust and today we're going to take a closer look at the bottlenose dolphin. Now often we think of dolphins as tropical species that we've got to go on holiday to see, but that's not the case. We've got a resident population of bottlenose dolphin here in Scotland and that means they live here all year round. They can be seen along the east coast from the Murray Firth, which is a protected area just for them, all the way down to the Firth of Forth and sometimes even further. They can even occasionally be seen crossing the English border from the English coasts. So now that you know where they are, let's take a look at what makes our bottlenose dolphins so suited to their life in Scottish waters. Scottish bottlenose dolphins are quite chunky animals. They are bigger than tropical bottlenose dolphins, with males sometimes reaching over 3.5 metres in length. They also have an extra layer of blubber and this, along with their size, helps to keep them warm in Scottish seas. That's not the only adaptation that allows our dolphins to live in water and if we take a closer look at this skull then we can see these more clearly. Now this isn't a bottlenose dolphin skull because I unfortunately don't have one of those. This is a short beak common dolphin or common dolphin which I kindly have on loan from the National Museum of Scotland. But the features are similar enough that we can take a little look um, to demonstrate the bottlenose dolphin features. So the first thing to notice is at the top of the head there's a blowhole here. Now all whales and dolphins have these, some whales have two, and this allows them to breathe. Now if you've ever seen a dolphin on the television or in the wild, you'll notice that you will see a spray coming from the top of their head. Now what this is, is the dolphin actually taking a breath. So the first thing they'll do when they come to the surface is they take a big breath out and they'll expel all the air that's in their lungs. And this forces any water that's at the top of the head near the blowhole to be forced out and up. And that's what you see as the spray. And then once they've done that, they're safe to take a deep breath in, knowing that they're not going to breathe anything harmful in because the blowhole is now clear. And so they get a nice clean breath of air. Now we might think of dolphins sometimes as not needing to do this because it's very easy to just think of them as marine animals always in the water. But they are of course mammals, not fish. So unlike sharks, which can get their air from the water or their oxygen from the water as they're swimming through, Dolphins and whales do need to come to the surface to breathe and this need to surface affects almost everything about the way they live in their marine environment and it can also help you to become a better dolphin watcher if you learn the breathing patterns of the different species then it can help you to spot them when you're doing your whale watching. Now the next thing I wanted to point out was this part of the dolphin's skull which is where the melon would be. This is a structure that allows the bottlenose dolphins to do something incredibly important, which is to echolocate. Echolocation is a process by which the dolphins send out sound into the environment and listen for the echoes in order that they can better understand their surroundings. Now it's quite a complicated process and it's still being studied to fully understand how that works, but essentially what the dolphin does is it makes sounds inside its head using structures like phonic lips and it sends those out through the front of its head through the melon. The melon is a structure full of fatty tissue, so it acts as an acoustic lens, focusing those sounds as they're emitted into the environment. And the dolphin will then listen for the echoes of those sounds, which bounce off different objects, and it will gain an understanding of those objects in their place. Now, it can't listen for these sounds the same way we might, because bottlenose dolphins don't have external ears. So what actually happens is when the sounds bounce off the objects, they'll come back through the lower jaw of the dolphin all the way through to the inner ear. When you think about it, this is an amazing technique and it's essential for the dolphin's life underwater. They can't always see their location or their prey, but this allows them to navigate their surroundings and find their food. And they're so good at it that they can even detect targets up to 100 metres away. So the last thing I wanted to talk to you about is the dolphin's teeth. Now just to remind you, this is not a bottlenose dolphin skull, but it is similar enough for me to illustrate. So all dolphins have teeth, not all whales do, but the dolphins do. And they have these on the upper and lower jaw. So if I turn this over, you will see where the bottlenose dolphin's teeth would be. You can see all these holes along the jawline there, and it's got the same on the lower jaw. So a bottlenose dolphin has between 80 and 100 teeth, and they're all conical shaped. So the reason for this is they've got a fairly varied diet, but it's mainly things like fish and cephalopods, so that's octopus and squid, and they're all quite slippy items of prey, and it'll eat these whole. So what it needs its teeth to do is to grip those items so that it can swallow them down. It doesn't need to do any chewing, and that's why you've not got any flatter teeth like molars. 
So, when you see a bottlenose dolphin with a fish, you'll often see it swallow it in one, unless of course it decides to have a bit of fun, in which case you'll see it throw it in the air a few times first. There was one last thing I wanted to show you before I put the skull away, and that was for ID purposes. So when people start out watching dolphins, they'll often get a bit confused between dolphins and porpoises, and maybe sometimes even use the two terms interchangeably if you're not sure what features you're looking for. But actually there's some really key ways to tell the difference. Um, so porpoises are a lot smaller than bottlenose dolphins. Um, if I show you this, this is a harbour porpoise skull, and you can see it's a lot smaller than the one we were looking at earlier, the common dolphin. So even though it's got some of those same features, you've got the blowhole, and the jaw where the teeth would be, it's a lot smaller. Also the behaviour of the species is different, so harbour porpoise are quite shy, they're not as gregarious as the bottlenose dolphin, and they move through the water very differently, so when you're watching them you'll often only see a small part of their back and their little triangular fin coming out of the water before they're back down again. So if you're seeing animals in a big pod jumping out of the water and they're quite large, then you're probably looking at bottlenose dolphins. There is one other amazing adaptation for water which I wanted to talk about and that's reproduction. As we've seen, bottlenose dolphins are mammals and that means they give birth to live young. When you think about it, giving birth to a baby in water could be problematic. So how do they do this? The answer is that unlike terrestrial mammals, dolphins give birth to their young tail first. This means that the blowhole of the baby, or calf, is only in the water at the very last stage of the birth, reducing the chances of the baby drowning. Once the calf is born, the mother or nearby female will immediately push it to the surface so that it can take its first breaths. The calf will then stay alongside mom and will feed on the fat rich milk that she produces, helping it grow. Calves start to learn to feed for themselves at around 18 months, but they stay with mom for up to five years. You can often spot the calves quite easily if you're watching a pod of dolphins. Apart from being much smaller, they're lighter in colour. Really little ones have stripes on them called fetal folds from where they've been curled up in the womb. I mentioned at the start of this video that we have a resident population of bottlenose dolphins in Scotland, so I wanted to finish off by looking at whereabouts you can see them and how this population is studied. You can get incredible views of these dolphins at sites all along the Murray Firth, places like Spey Bay, Burghead and Channery Point. The dolphins can be travelling past or they might stay around for hours, feeding, breaching and playing, all just metres from the shore. Another brilliant place to see the dolphins is Torrey Battery in Aberdeen. The dolphins are here almost every day and I know that because there are dedicated volunteers with WDC Shorewatch who see them there, even on Christmas Day. Again, you can see the dolphins for hours at a time, playing and bow riding as the big boats come in and out of the harbour. And finally, my last top spot for watching the bottlenose dolphins along the east coast of Scotland is the Firth of Forth, from the Fife and East Lothian coasts. There are around 200 bottlenose dolphins in this population, and researchers study them using a non-invasive technique, photo ID. By taking photos of the dorsal fin of the dolphins, they can match them up to known individuals based on the unique patterns of notches and markings. This allows scientists to monitor the population and to learn from them, which can provide important information for making sure that decisions are made which best protect the species. Here you can see a few examples from Aberdeen where surveys are carried out every year. The images are uploaded into a database and provide key information on the structure and health of the population. For example, they can identify age and gender, follow the relationships between different individuals and establish how many new calves are born. Scientists can also keep track of individuals with deformities using this technique and look at the impact of those deformities as well as how they affect the lifespan of those individuals. This dolphin is called Fetri. You can see she has a deformity of the spine called scoliosis. Despite this, she copes very well and is able to feed and socialise along with the rest of the pod. I hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit more about bottlenose dolphins. We are so lucky to share our Scottish coast with these animals. Sadly, they are still facing the constant threats of noise pollution, disturbance and entanglement, to name just a few. And these all affect their key behaviours that we've been exploring today in this video. The Murray Firth is a special area of conservation, that's a type of marine protected area with a high level of protection and it's essential for this species, as is the ongoing conservation work which helps to reduce the impacts of these threats. 
I'd like to say a special thank you to the teams at WDC Scottish Dolphin Centre and WDC Shorewatch volunteers for getting me introduced into the wonderful world of dolphin watching. If you would like to find out more about Scotland's dolphins and how you can protect them, do check out their website and maybe even consider becoming a Shorewatch volunteer. You can find out more about Scotland's wonderful marine wildlife and the marine conservation work of the Scottish Wildlife Trust by checking out our Living Seas pages on our website.